Hello there, Wes Terasaki here. Our study for today is the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. Actually, we'll include the last four verses of chapter 17. Chapter 18 is the fourth major sermon in the book of Matthew. So far, we've covered the Sermon on the Mount, the Mission Discourse, and the Parables of the Kingdom. This one has been called the Community Prescription, or Church Life and Discipline. And the final one, in chapters 24 and 25, is the Olivet Discourse. We'll start with a short story about the temple tax at the end of chapter 17. What was this? This was a Jewish tax collected by Jews, independent of the taxes imposed by the Romans, in order to support the temple in Jerusalem. It amounted to two Greek drachma, or two Roman denarii, with the denarius equivalent to a day's wages for the common laborer. It was paid by all Jewish men over 20 years old, once a year. Women, slaves, and minors were exempt. Gentiles and Samaritans were not allowed to pay. Priests and others who had occupations solely in God's service were exempt. Here's the situation. Peter is asked if Jesus pays the temple tax, and Peter says yes. Jesus must have overheard the conversation and later asks a question that may seem strange. Do kings tax their own children? Peter suggests they do not, and Jesus agrees. Why this odd question? The implication here is that the temple tax is an obligation to God, but since Jesus is God's son, he should not have to pay. Nonetheless, in order to avoid causing offense, Jesus creates a way for the tax to be paid by providing a fish with a coin in its mouth. That coin, worth four drachmas, would be enough to pay the tax for both Jesus and Peter. The Bible never tells us if Peter did in fact go fishing in the Sea of Galilee, or if he got the coin. As we will see in a moment, this is not important to the meaning of the story. However, if you go to the various restaurants around Galilee today, you can purchase a nice lunch. Peter's fish, complete with fries and salad. It is tilapia. Why is this story in the Bible? Is it a lesson for us that we should obey those in authority over us? Or that God will provide for our financial needs? Or that Jesus can do cool miracles like putting coins in fishes' mouths? Well, all of these things do happen, but there are more profound lessons here. In fact, at least five lessons. Pretty amazing in a story that is only four verses long. Jesus focuses on his mission. He could argue with the collectors that he is not obligated to pay the tax, but the collectors are just middlemen. If Jesus wanted to press the issue, he'd have to go to the temple authorities and take it up with them. This would likely be a drawn-out, acrimonious affair over an incidental tax that would only sidetrack and distract. Jesus focuses on people. That he does not wish to offend the collectors is not because he is averse to confrontation. It's likely that Jesus is concerned about causing these people to stumble, something that he elaborates on in the very next chapter. These tax collectors are as precious to him as anyone who is following him. Jesus focuses on his unique relationship with the Father. He sees immediately the incongruity of his paying the temple tax. Jesus focuses on teaching his disciples. Once again, he is impressing upon them his identity as the Son of God. And by implication, God focuses on his fulfillment of the law. He knows that soon there will no longer be a need to sacrifice in the temple because his cross will be the final sacrifice. If Christ is focusing on these things, we should not devote our attention to that which is not relevant. It doesn't matter whether Jesus provided money for the other disciples, or if Peter in fact did end up paying the tax. The story is not primarily about Jesus meeting a financial obligation. It is about his identity and mission. The chapter 18 discourse starts out with the disciples coming to Jesus and asking, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
Now, right away, we're apt to distance ourselves from the disciples and look at them as audacious and silly for even asking the question, right? But let's put ourselves in their shoes for a moment, or actually in their sandals for a moment. It was Jesus himself who brought up the notion of greatness in the kingdom. He pointed to the greatness of John the Baptist and then shocked us all by saying that the least in the kingdom is even greater than John. And then came the transfiguration, and even though only three of them witnessed it, you can bet that all the disciples found out what happened there. They saw Moses and Elijah, two of the greatest figures in Israelite history. On top of this, Jesus, their leader and the greatest in the kingdom, says he's going to die. It's no wonder the disciples have questions of hierarchy on their minds. To be honest, I would too. Jesus does not rebuke them for their lack of understanding, nor does he mention their little faith. Rather, he gives an object lesson. A child. He says the greatest in the kingdom is the one who is like a child. Now, children have all sorts of qualities, some good and some bad. We are not to be childish. What Jesus is referring to is the child's humble position in life. In Jewish society... Children held little importance. It was not the role of children to get their own way, to be looked up to, to be proud or have status. Incredibly, those who are great in the kingdom are to be like that. This is yet another paradox in the kingdom of God. John MacArthur says, If we insist on retaining the privileges of adulthood, if we want to be our own boss, do our own thing, govern our own lives, We cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. But if we are willing to come on the basis of childlike faith and receive salvation with the humility of a child, with a willingness to surrender to Christ's authority, then we are coming with the right attitude. Being in the kingdom does not mean entering a competition for the supreme place, but engaging in lowly service. True greatness consists not in receiving service, but in giving it. As Jesus is talking about children, he changes the term to an adult metaphor, little ones. These are his true disciples, the ones who have humbled themselves before God. He has previously used the same expression in chapters 10 and 11, but now he begins an extensive discussion on little ones. Causing one of his little ones to sin or stumble is horrible. Losing one of his little ones from his kingdom is horrible. Failing to help restore a fellow little one who is sinning is horrible. And failing to forgive is horrible. Jesus covers these topics by giving us two parables and one paradigm. Let's discuss the two parables first. The first one is the parable of the wandering sheep. You might remember that a parable is a fictional story that is usually meant to convey one main spiritual point. In this one, a man who owns a hundred sheep leaves ninety-nine of them in order to find the one that wandered away. When he does, his joy is very great. That is the story. Now let me ask you, who is the man in the parable? I'll give you a clue. He is not God or Jesus. And who are the sheep? They are not people in or out of the church. As we pointed out in chapter 13, we should resist the temptation to allegorize parables. The early church made this mistake. They said the man was God, the lost sheep was humanity, and the 99 were angels. No, the man in this parable is exactly what it says, a hypothetical sheep owner who cares deeply about his sheep, and that is all. The sheep in this parable are sheep. The story is cast in the style of a how-much-more argument. It makes us appreciate how deeply God cares for anyone who might drift away from the faith. The logic of the parable is this. If a shepherd will go after a lost sheep and rejoice when he finds it, how much more will God search for a lost strayed person and rejoice when he recovers that person? If this were an allegory and the man is God, then we have to ask whether the man is irresponsible in leaving the 99 sheep unattended, or if he cares less for the flock compared to the lost one. 
To focus on such details is to miss the parable's meaning, which is the certainty of searching and the celebration of finding. The second story is the parable of the servant who had no mercy. This is a parable about forgiveness. Peter asked Christ how many times he should forgive a brother or sister who sins against him. And as he often does, Jesus gives a much fuller answer than just a number. He tells a parable. A servant owes his master a huge amount of money. When he is unable to repay the money, the servant pleads for mercy. The master takes pity and forgives the debt. The servant, however, shows no such mercy to a fellow servant who owes him a much smaller amount. When the master hears of this, he severely punishes the first servant for his unforgiving attitude and hardness of heart. Now remember, this is a parable, so the exact amounts of money, other than they are too large to pay back, are not significant. The question of how a person who is in prison can pay back a debt, or the justness of the master revoking his original pardon and authorizing torture, these sorts of things are not important to the primary meaning of the parable. Don't miss the forest for the trees. Remember that parables mirror only certain aspects of reality. Not everything in the story has parallels outside the parable. That is where their illustrative value lies. This parable explains why Jesus gave a large number, 77, as the number of times to forgive someone. Even 77 is not an upper limit. God eternally and unconditionally forgives those who repent of so immense a debt against him that it is unconscionable for believers to refuse to grant forgiveness to each other for sins that remain trivial in comparison. Those who will not forgive cannot expect to be forgiven. If the church is the community of the forgiven, then all its relationships will be marked by a forgiveness which is not a mere form of words, but an essential characteristic. Forgiveness does not mean acceptance of sinful behavior. Let's go to the section that we skipped in verses 15 through 19. This is a paradigm, an example or model for us to follow. When someone sins against us, we should be proactive and appropriate in helping to correct the problem and restore the relationship. There's a logical and reasonable process. First deal with it privately. If unsuccessful, get the help of two or three others. Though this is not a trial or judicial proceeding, the principle of needing to involve two or three witnesses, as seen in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, is in play. Deuteronomy 19 says every matter must be proved by the words of two or three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5 says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Further refusal on the part of the offender would then involve the church. With each successive step, the grievance is made more public, and ideally many matters can be dealt with privately and with consideration. And just remember, the attempt is to rescue and restore a person, not punish. Note that just as in chapter 16, Jesus talks again about binding and loosing, and this time it is an authority given to all disciples, not just Peter. This passage presupposes that the church is acting according to God's word and is seeking and sensitive to God's will. We cannot close our study of this section without mentioning a tiny but controversial phrase found in verse 10. It is the two words, their angels. Here is the context. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What is meant by their angels? Do we have angels assigned to us, watching over us individually, to guide and protect us, and to represent us before God? Whenever we hear a bell ring, does an angel earn his wings? Well, we know the second question is unbiblical, and I've only ever heard it said in Jimmy Stewart's movie, It's a Wonderful Life. But how about the first? Do we have guardian angels? Look at these passages. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. 
for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Do such passages imply that we each have guardian angels? In the Old Testament, angels watch over nations, and in Revelation, angels appear to be assigned to individual churches. The ancient Jews clearly believed in guardian angels. But the closest the Bible comes to suggesting personal individual spirits designed to serve believers is probably found in Hebrews. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? The question of guardian angels is unanswered, and perhaps it is unanswerable. But let me ask you one more question. Who made this promise? I am surely with you always to the very end of the age. Yes, you are correct. That is the concluding statement of the Gospel of Matthew, words not of an angel, but of God himself. He has called us friends, and he sticks closer than a brother. He knows us when we sit and when we rise. He perceives our thoughts from afar and discerns our going out and our lying down. Before we say a word, he knows it completely. His hand is upon us, and he is familiar with all of our ways. He hides us in the shadow of his wings. With a God like that, who needs a guardian angel?